Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let us um, let us uh, continue our lecture today. So last time, we was trying to uh, compute the errors for the um, finite element method that we um, we show. So so the idea of the finite element method is okay. You have to solve this equation using with zero value condition, right? And this is for x in zero one. So so what you do is you write it in the the form of the last min gram theorem and you arrive at something like like this right so the goal is so this is true so this is the strong form and this is the weak form all right so the idea is to solve so so this um, to solve this equation on zero one right so we need to find uh, we need to solve the weak form to solve the weak equation. Um, so, 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 so we, um, so the weak form is easier than the strong form because uh, uh, from from the weak form you can um, you uh, you can apply Lax-Mean gram theorem, right? And now from the weak form you do another. Um, um, another approximation. Uh, so you, you're going to get a finite element form. So this is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of u prime v prime plus uh v f v for all of the v in, in a finite element space, right? So, so the idea is that, okay, instead of solving this equation, we're going to solve something which is easier by solving this finite element form, right? So, and then the, so, so, so the, the idea is that you approximate this um, S01 by a finite dimensional space, HS, right? So, um, so the HS, what is the space HS? So the space HS will be um, the space of piecewise linear function, right? From zero to one. Right, so um, the space HS will be the space of all of the piecewise linear function from zero to one. Um, 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 right, so, um, so what we do is we do a, uh, um, we did do an approximation. We don't solve the equation on, on H, we solve the equation on the space HS. Um, and then uh, the point we want to do is that, um, um, so, um, so when H tend to zero, um, UH go to U. So is it safe to solve the equation on this, um, on this finite dimensional space? Um, because when you send the mesh size, when you send the mesh size um, to zero, the approximate solution will go to the original equation, right? Um, so, so, and then we, we're gonna prove something like um, an error estimate of the type C of H, C is a constant. <laughs> So in this case, in this case, I'm gonna say that the arrow is of order one. And this is our goal um, of, of, of doing the error analysis, right? So we want to, we want to know that, okay, um, when we do this approximation, we want, when we approximate a, a, a continuous function um, um, by piecewise linear functions, um, the order is always one, right? Right, so, so now what we did in the previous class is the following. <clears throat> First, we consider a projection, pi, which is going from S01 to HS. This is the space H, right? You project a function U in H to, um, to HS. So this projection is, again, so this projection is, um, 
is what you see in the previous picture, right? So, so you have a curve, and then you approximate that by piecewise linear function, right? So, right? So. So basically, this is the projection. Um, so you project, so this is you, and the red line will be pi u, right? So in this case, you have u is pi u plus u second, and pi u and u second, the orthogonal, right? Because this is Hilbert space. Uh, when you split the Hilbert space into two subspace, um, the two components are, are orthogonal, right? Um, so in the previous class, I used uh, a special uh, technique, which is the projection of the solution of any function on H onto the space of piecewise linear function, right? So when, when I do that, a curve like this will be approximated by, by the projection, which is a, a piecewise linear function. And then U will be pi U plus U second. And because those are the vector spaces, uh, pi U and U second are orthogonal, right? So some of you asked me, what is the definition of the basis of a vector space? Of a vector space. So can you tell me what is the basis of a vector space? So, so given a vector space H. Essentially, is it a um, set of all vectors um, that whose linear combination can form all the ve all the vectors in that space. Yes, excellent. So, uh, so 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 according to Surat, um, so so if I give you a vector space H, you can find a collection uh, B, uh, not B. Um, so say um, uh, I call it uh, X will be the set of all of the vector U one. U2 or phi1, phi2, phi3, etc. right? Such that first you're gonna have X is linear independent. So X is linear independent means that, okay, you, uh, you if you have A1 of phi um, I1, so you, you pick a, a set of um, of of any um, k vector, right? So so this uh, this is a, a an arbitrary k vector in in the x, right? So suppose that this sum is zero, then a one, a two, a k has to be zero. They are all zero, right? So if you if you if you pick any um, if you pick any um, components, uh, any linear combination of or, uh, of any um, subset of this uh, um, uh, um, uh, set X, if this linear combination is zero, then all of the coefficient has to be zero, right? So the second thing is that okay, suppose that U is in H, then there has to be a one, a two, a k, and those are real numbers. And phi i one, phi i k, those are, um, are vectors such that you can be expressed as a combination of all, all of those vectors, right? Which means that in this case, the uh, space x spans, um, that set x spans the space h, right? It's good, right? So, so, so this is a, 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 a is this is the basis of a vector space definition. So you have a vector space, uh, space H, uh, and then so you consider a set X. So this is a basis when, when X is linear independent in the sense that if you take any linear combination of any subset of X, and this if this linear combination is zero, then all of the coefficient has to be zero. And then if you take a U in H, then there will be constant A1, AK in R, and vectors V1, V, um, phi i1, phi i k in x, such that u can be expressed as a linear combination of uh, phi1 to phi i k, right? In this case, you said that x span h, 
right? So in this case, um, in this case, in this case, um, HS is a subspace of H, right? And then you project U onto uh, this subspace, meaning that, okay, you pick, so, so HS will be uh, spanned by, so X will be the basis of HS, right? So, so in this case, um, HS will be spanned by a set X. And then, um, S will be spanned by a set X union with a set Y. So X union Y will be basis of, of H. In this case, X intersect with Y is an empty set, right? Right, so for instance, um, HS will be spanned by X1 to X9, um, and S will be spanned by X1 to X9, So this is nine vectors, and this is 10 vectors, right? So in this case, um, HS has nine vectors that are the, um, that, are the that, that, that form a basis for HS, and because uh, the space H is bigger, it has 10 vectors. So, so, so in this case, the set X will be the nine vector, and the Y will be the last vectors, all right? Okay, so, so when you project Pi u onto um, um, HS. So pi u will be so pi u will be a linear combination of uh, a one to to a nine x pi, for instance, right? So when you project this u onto HS, for instance, then pi u will be a linear combination of a x one a x. Uh, of, of x1 to x9, and the u prime will be a linear combination of the last vector, right? And they're orthogonal, because uh, we have a, an orthogonal vector space. Okay, so in this case, u uh, can be decomposed into pi u plus u second, and then, um, and then uh, uh, pi u and u second, they're orthogonal, right? So remember that, because we know that, okay, this, uh, the, the HS is the space of all of P, all of the piecewise linear constant uh, uh, linear function. So basically, the projection will be a piecewise linear function. So what you do is something like this. All right, right. So so this is the projection that we we are interested in, right? Now what we want to solve is an equation of the type P U V will be L of V for all of the V in H and And then, uh, and then we want to. Um, we we know that. So what we have now is that B U V solve the original equation for all of the V in H, and B U uh, S solve um, the approximation in which U is in um, U is in. Um, V is in H H, right? So because this is true for all of the V in H, and H H is a subspace of H, so this is true for all of the V in H S, right? So this is true for the bigger set, so it should be true for the smaller set. Now what I do is I subtract the two things. I have V U H minus U H V, and this will be zero, right? Because this is going to be L V minus L V. All right. Now, uh, right. So, so now, so now I call this the arrow. So this is e. E will be u minus u h, which means that this is the arrow. Right. And 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 we know that b of e v is going to be zero for all of the v in h s. Right. Number four. So I didn't know E to be U minus U H. So this is basically the arrow. It's, it's the arrow. And we know that B E V is going to be zero for the V in H S. Right? Um, right. So now what, what I have is the following. I consider C the B E E. 
Um, so BE is, is bigger than, um, as we discussed in the previous lab class, BE is, is bigger than E square in H, and this is the coercivity. This is one key point that we're gonna, uh, we're gonna use. So my questions to you is that, okay, questions. Does E belong uh, belongs to HH. Uh, yes. Anyone knows? So I consider the solution, the difference between the original equation and the approximate solution. I call it the arrow. Thus, the arrow belongs to HH. I think no. Why? So sure, absolutely sure. that this is a no, which is a very good answer. Because and, it is the projection. And right. um, if it is the orthogonal projection, it, uh, it cannot have any component um, that can be computed with a basis of HH. Right, so, so a better idea, a better observation. Yes, that, that's correct. But, uh, but an easier way to see this is the following. So you know that BE, uh, v will be zero, right? Formula V in, in this space, right? So if E belongs to this, which means that B E will be zero, right? So if if E belongs to H H, then you you know from this equation that B E V will be zero for all of V in H H. So if V is in H H, then B E will be zero, all right? And what's, what 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 happens next? So if B is zero, what happens next? Then error is zero. Right. So yes, so Rap got it. So here you have zero is B E E, and this is bigger than uh, alpha E a square. All right. Uh, this is bigger than E S square, um, but but this means that E is zero, right? Because the norm of E is, is bigger than zero. And then the arrow is zero. So which means that you are solving an exact equation and this is not the case. You are solving the approximated, uh, 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 the approximation, right? So, so the arrow is never zero. When you run the code, it's never zero, right? So now, so now we, we know that um, E doesn't belong to HH, but you know that E, uh, V uh, is zero for V in HH, right? So now, so now, let us look at BE. So BE will be B E U minus U H by definition because E is U minus U H, right? So, uh, so now I have B. So my my idea is to to use the fact that B E V is zero for all of V in H S, right? So then I I gonna split it. So B E U minus so U minus U H is going to be u minus pi u plus pi u minus u h, right? So then this gives you b u minus pi u plus b e pi u minus u h. All right, so you split, you split u minus u h, and then uh, because u minus u h is u minus pi u plus pi u minus u h. All right, so you split it, you have b e u minus pi u plus b e pi u minus u h, all right? The second term is of course zero because pi u belong to HH and UH belong to HH. So the, the difference has to be in HH. And because the difference is in HH, according to the fact that BEV is zero for all of the V in HH, then the second term is zero. Now I'm so now I'm happy because here I have something like this, BE U minus pi U. And then I have an, the coercive inequality. So this is bigger than E S square. And this is going to give me the estimate. All right, uh, it's clear. Right, so now this is the point where we, um, we, we're gonna uh, derive the error estimate. Number five, um, so now you have one. You have B E U minus pi U 
is bigger than alpha eh squared. Right, so, so what is the form of this? So b will be the integral from zero to one of e u minus pi u dx plus the integral from zero to one of, so this is prime, okay? This is u minus pi u dx is going to be bigger than alpha, um, the integral from zero to one. So h will be at zero one, so I have e prime square dx. All right, good. All right, so now, uh, now what I, uh, what I gonna show um, is the, um, so, so this is uh, the, the estimate that I obtained from the previous um, uh, class. So we have B E U minus pi U is going to be bigger than alpha E uh, square, right? So the B by definition will be the integral from zero to one of E prime U minus pi U prime dx plus the integral from zero to one of e u minus pi u dx. And this is bigger than alpha. The norm of h zero one will be um, the integral from zero to one of e prime square. All right. All right, so, um, so now we're gonna, we're gonna uh, try to deduce some estimate from this, right? So, so I, so, um, so, so before going on, I'm gonna sh show you one lemma. This is the interpolation estimate. Interpolation estimate. So the interpolation estimate say the following. Suppose that for W, which is uh, a function in S01, right? Now we consider the projection, the projection. So this is true for any W. This is true for any W. It doesn't necessarily um, that W is the solution of our equation. This is true for all of W in S01. Consider the projection pi W from S01 to, uh, to HH, then, W minus pi W prime L2 will be smaller than C of H. Or in other words, the order of the difference between W and the projection will be of order H. So we're gonna use this interpolation estimate and we're gonna show it later, right? So I explain again. Now, before going on, I'm gonna need an, uh, an estimate, which is the so-called interpolation estimate. The interpolation estimate says that, okay, if you, have a, if you have any function in H01, and you consider the projection of W onto HH, right? Then uh, the difference um, between W and the projection will be of order H. So this is going to be smaller than CS, or equivalently, you can write um, that this is of order H. So this is OH, meaning that this is of order H, right? We're gonna use this uh, uh, estimate to find out, to, to bound E prime, right? So I will go, so I will go is to bound E prime square using one and the, the interpolation estimate. Right, so we're gonna use the interpolation estimate and the first inequality. So someone see how to do it. So this is something that we do over and over again. How can I do it? Right, so I have an inequality of the type one. And I want to derive about for this guy by a constant. I'm gonna say that this is of order S square. Uh, right, so um, how can I derive the bound? 
what kind of estimate that I should use. No? So the only estimate that you can use for this kind of thing is what? You want to use, yes, hold on, right? Right, so who said that? Okay, so the only estimate that you have is his holder estimate, right? So I'm gonna have what? I'm gonna have E prime U minus U prime dx is going to be smaller than the integral from zero to one of E prime square dx one half. And then the integral from zero to one of U minus pi U prime dx, one half, right? I apply Holder inequality for the first term. So this first term will give you a half of this quantity. Remember that, okay. So here I have this quantity, and here I have one half of this quantity, all right? This is something that I like, because on the left-hand side, I have this quantity, and on the right-hand side, I have a I can bound this guy by a half of this quantity. So the second term, how can I bound the second term? So the second term will be, will be what? How can I, so, so the first term, I'm gonna keep it. And for the second term, it's gonna be L2 norm of u minus pi u prime L2. So how can I bound this guy? Now this is right there. Use the lemma. Right. So so Lee was correct. So so you use this lemma, right? So according to Liu, so according to according to you're gonna use this lemma, right? Um, you're gonna use this this lemma. So then I have e prime square dx one half times ch. So I have s already. I have one half of this guy, right? Suppose that I don't have the first term. Suppose that I don't have the first term. Then I have what uh, e prime square dx uh, one half ch is going to be bigger than e prime square dx. Right, and this means that CH square is going to be bigger than E prime square DX. Right, and then this is nice. Right, I explain again. I have two terms on the, on the left hand side. The first term, I use holder inequality. When I use holder inequality, I have the integral from zero to one of E prime square DX one half, and the second terms give me the integral from zero to one of U minus pi U prime DX one half. Right, so the first term, I'm happy because I'm gonna use it to the right hand side. The second term, I, I can bound it by CH, which is the lemma that I have here. Right, so, so which means that the first term here is bounded uh, by the integral from zero to one of E prime square dx one half times CH. Suppose that I don't have the second term. So I only have that the integral from zero to one of E prime u minus pi u prime the x is going to be bigger than alpha integral from zero to one of e prime square the x. All right, right. So so um, so which mean that I have what I have this guy is bigger than the the right the, the the right hand side, meaning that I have the integral from zero to one of e prime square the x one half ch is going to be bigger than the integral from zero to one of e uh, prime square the x. So because here I have one half, here I have one, so I can remove it. And then I square both sides, I have CS square, it's going to be bigger than integral from zero to one of E prime square dx. So this is nice, but uh, the trouble is that I have the second term. All right, so I have one, I have alpha of integral from zero to one of E prime square dx is going to be smaller than integral from zero to one of E prime u minus pi u prime dx plus the integral from zero to one of e, u minus pi u dx. And then the second term, the first term I bounded by, 
the integral from 0 to 1 of e prime square dx 1 half times ch. Right? So, so I bound the first term. If I don't have the, first, the second term, then, then, uh, then I'm okay. Now, the trouble is that, okay, here I have the second term. Right? So how can I estimate the second term? Any ideas? Again, this is something that we did already. So who remember what, what did we do? So we're gonna use Hodel inequality again, right? I'm gonna use Hodel inequality again. So I have this is one half, and then this is u minus pi u square dx one half, right? Okay, so for the second term, which is the term that I'm um, putting it into the circle. For the second term, for the second term, I'm gonna use Holder inequality, right? Um, right, so, um, so I, I got, I, I'm using Holder inequality, so then I have the interval from zero to one of e u minus pi u, e squared dx one half, and um, interval from zero to one of u minus u squared dx one half. Now, how can I bound these two quantity? We use one inequality that we already learned. What is it? Right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bow this guy by, basically I'm gonna use, I'm gonna bow this guy by e prime square dx one half. And this guy, I'm gonna bow it by u minus pi u prime square dx one half, all right? So who remember what is, what is, is the inequality that I'm using, right? Again, I explain again. For the second term, I use whole inequality. So integral from zero to one of e, u minus pi u dx is going to be smaller than integral from zero to one of e squared dx, one half. And the second term will be integral from zero to one of u minus pi u square dx, one half, all right? I'm saying that this guy is going to be smaller than the integral from zero to one of e prime square dx, one half. And the second guy will be smaller than the integral from zero to one of u minus pi u prime square dx, one half. So I'm bounding a function, uh, the L2 norm of the function by the L2 norm of the derivative of that function. What is the inequality? Is it the Sobolev embedding? Theory? Right, so yes, Molly is correct. So, so this is the Sobolev embedding. Theorem. So Bolev embedding. Meaning that if I consider W to be in S01, then L2 norm of W will be smaller than the L2 norm of W prime. Right? So this is basically the Sobolev embedding theorem. Right, so the so lab embedding theorem allows you to bound L2 norm by the H1, uh, S01 norm, right? So this is the L2 norm, and this is the S01 norm. So the, the so, so lab embedding theorem allows you to bound L2 norm by the L2 norm of the derivatives. So now, this is what I'm using. I'm using the fact that, okay, first, this guy is going to be the smaller than the L2 norm of E and L2 norm of U minus pi U. Next, next I use superlap embedding theorem. I say that the L2 norm of E will be smaller than the L2 norm of E prime, and the L2 norm of U minus pi U will be smaller than the L2 norm of U minus pi U prime square, right? Now, what is the next step? How can I continue? So I know that the second term is smaller than this guy, right? So I know that the second term is circle. So I have the under, 
so I have this term, the first term, and I have this circle term. So the circle term, the second term, will be smaller than um, e prime squared dx one half. So I use the, a combination of holding inequality and Sobolev embedding inequality. Now, how can I move forward? How can I bound the last term here? How can I about this quantity? I checked it, right? A couple of minutes ago. How, so what did I do a few minutes ago? I used the lemma, right? Remember that, okay, in the previous estimate for the first term, I have the whole inequality. And so the whole inequality allows me to bow the L2 norm of E prime and L2 norm of U minus pi U prime, right? So, so here I have it exactly the same situation. I have the L2 norm of E prime and the L2 norm of U minus U prime. So I use the interpolation lemma, right? Right, so this is smaller than integral from zero to one of E prime squared dx one half. Um, and then this is going to be smaller than CH, right? So it's exactly the same. So the circle one will be smaller than this square term. And the first term will also, uh, uh, is also smaller than this square term. Now I put this guy and this guy together. So I put those two guys together, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get alpha of the integral from zero to one of E prime square dx. And this is smaller than or equal to E prime U minus pi U prime dx plus the integral from zero to one of e u minus pi u dx, right? So I know that the first term is smaller than the integral from zero to one of e prime square dx one half, and this is ch. And the second one is, is going to be the same. So I have e prime square dx one half of h, all right? Right, so I have that this guy is smaller than the sum of two guys. The first guy is smaller than c times integral from zero to one of e prime square dx one half h, and the second guy is smaller than c integral from zero to one of e prime dx one half h. Right. Now I put things together, so I have the integral from zero to one of e prime square dx. So I combine these two things into two. So I have c the integral from zero to one of e prime square dx one half h, right? So then this is the final inequality that allows me to get the arrow, right? So basically, um, basically I have that the integral from zero to one of e prime square one half is going to be smaller than two c over alpha, right? <sighs> Right, so so here, I divide both sides by this one half, and then so I have two ch over alpha. And now I take the square. Uh, I I don't have to take the square. So this is basically the h zero one norm of e, and this is smaller than two c over alpha of h. Right. So so this e will be the arrow. So u minus u h s zero one is going to be two c over alpha. Right. And this is our final result. In other words, I have u minus u h, s zero one is of order h. So in this algorithm, um, the difference between u h and u is of order h. I'm saying that this is an, 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 an order one algorithm, order one arrow, right? So, so and the estimate that I'm showing you. Um, that I have just showed you is a so-called a priori estimate. Right, and, and if you Google this, you see that a priori estimate is, is one of the, the easiest um, um, estimate in a finite element method. You have also the so-called a prosti a prosti um, a uh, estimate. And then, and then, um, those are the basic things uh, of of uh, um, of 
um, of, um, of functional analysis that you can apply to find element method. So again, so I explain again to you uh, all of the steps. So first you use, um, first you use, um, first you use uh, uh, cohesive estimates to get alpha e square on the left hand side, right? After that, you remove, using the fact that BEV is zero for all of the V and VH, so you remove the term pi u minus UH. So pi u is in, v, in HS and, and UH is also in HS. So the left over, over will be BE uh, pi, u minus pi u. So the idea of all of this inequality is something like this. So you have EH square is going to be smaller than B, E, U minus pi U. And in some sense, this is smaller than E times U minus pi U. So this is, if you think of it as a, a very, um, uh, a very um, easy way. So this is AB smaller than A times B. That's it, right? So, so, so here you have, you have B E U minus pi U is smaller than E U, U minus pi U, and this is bigger than alpha C. So, so which means that you can remove one E here, and then this guy, the difference between a function and its projection is on, always of order H. So when you remove this E, you, gotta, you, you get an inequality, and this simple step can be seen here. So, so you have alpha the integral from zero to one of e prime um, is smaller than integral from zero to one of e prime u minus pi u prime and e u minus pi u. So the first term you bound it, it by the h one zero one norm of e prime of e, and then the second term will be u minus pi u prime. So this is of order h. The second term can can be done in the same way. So first, if you the inequality. After that, you use sublime embedding theorem to, to pass from L2 norm to the S01 um, norm. Now, uh, now, um, now, then, then here, this, uh, the second term, the first term will be the S01 norm of, uh, of E, and the second term will be of order H. So this gives you C times the, uh, the S01 norm of E times S, and C times the uh, as your one norm of e times h, you combine the two, you have that, okay, alpha integral from zero to one of e times square dx smaller than two c of, of the norm uh, times h. So basically this, this quantity is, is what I wrote to you here. You have alpha e square is smaller than c e times the, the h, right? So then which means that the error is, is of order h, and in this case, the algorithm is of order one, um, that because the error is, is order one, and, and the estimate that I show you is the so-called a priori estimate, which is the very basic estimate of, of finite, element, uh, finite element method, and everything is based on on um, on uh, Lakshmin Graham theorem. All right, so right, so so basically. So basically, to summarize, what I show you is how to show this equation. I will come back to the uh, interpolation inequality um, in, a, in a couple of minutes, so, but let, let me summarize what we've just learned. To solve this equation, this is the, the easiest uh, uh, elliptic equation, right? So this is elliptic equation, and this is the easiest one. So when you have parabolic equation, when you have a time derivative here, then this is more complicated. But this is not uh, our goal here. So I just want to show you um, how to solve an elliptic equation. Of course, if you don't have this u, then things become easy, right? If you don't have this u to just take anti-derivative uh, and you have an exact solution. But now, the thing is that you have this u, right? So to, have, to do that, you have to pass to the weak form And then you solve it for all of the phi in H01. So to, to do that, you pass the finite element, right? By, um, by, piece, to, uh, by, by the fact that you approximate the solution by piecewise linear, um, um, by piecewise linear um, uh, functions. 
Um, so you saw this guy on uh, on a subspace H H, right? And then um, a priori estimate. The a priori estimate gives you the the errors of the type O H. Right, so and everything is based on a very complicated um, um, measure theory, final, uh, uh, um, so we'll have embedding theorem. So, so measure theory, and then so we'll have embedding. And lux mean gram, and uh, what else? Um, and uh, an interpolation, right? Right. So to get this error estimate, you you have to know a lot of things. You have to know measure theory, superlab embedding, uh, superlab spaces, lax mean gram interpolation. Um, so what is the whole point of that? Why don't we just do numerically? Uh, the, 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 the algorithm without caring about the, the, the errors. So then my question is to you is that, can you do the same thing with this equation? Can we do the same finite element algorithm for this equation? Right, so so I'm gonna discuss about the uh, interpolation next in the next class. But the point that I want to highlight to you is that okay, so you pass from this to the weak form and from the weak form to finite element, and the whole mechanism works because you have an error estimate which says that uh, the the finite element solution is um, is close to the original solution and the order is a, right. Um, okay, so now my questions to you is that, okay, suppose that you know how to do finite element method, right? Suppose that I know how to do a element, finite element method. I'm gonna write the code. I'm gonna try to solve the equation in which I change the plus into a minus. Does it work? Right, so I just change the plus into the minus. Uh, here I put a number two, so that is doesn't uh, seem to be too easy, right? So I change the here the plus one to plus u to minus two u. So, so as, uh, I say that okay, if I do the finite element, element method, I, I, I do the call. Um, so what happened with the call? No? Any ideas? Any guess? Right? So you see the point? The point is that, okay, you have a finite element method already, which works for, for this equation. Okay? So you have an, a finite element method, which is to approximate the solution by uh, piecewise linear function. Now, so we know how to do it by so can we do it for this guy? Can we do this? So the, the difference is, is very small, right? So so I just replace you plus u by minus two u. So can we do the same finite element method? Can we just scale the second term using linearity? You kill the second term by linearity. Uh, how, how do you do it? I mean, can, you, can, we, can we scale it? Like you multiply scale. by my negative 0.5. Okay, but then you have to scale the first term. First term, right? 
Right. So Suref has a good idea, right? So you want to scale it. Why do you want to scale it? Meaning that the, the finite method doesn't work in this case, right? So, you, so your feeling is good because, because you think that you think that the method doesn't work because of the, the constant minus two, right? Right? This is a very good feeling, right? But why? Why do you want to scale it? So the reason you want to scale it is, the, is before, because of the following. So in the inequality, in the error analysis, the key is the coercivity, right? So, you, you, so the key of the error analysis is that BEE has to be bigger than E square in S01, right? Now, what happened here? So, so for this guy, the BEE will be E prime, E prime, E prime square DX minus two times E square DX. So in this case, BEE will be this guy, right? So, so the weak, if you write out a weak form of this second equation, you're gonna get BEE will be E prime square DX minus two times E square DX, right? This guy is not going to give you any um, any coactivity, right? Right. So explain again. If you write out a weak form, this guy you get ve will be e prime square dx minus two times e square dx. This is not going to be bigger than any alpha times e prime square dx. So you lose coactivity. Coactivity, which means that lax mean gram theorem is is not true anymore. Because the lax mean gram theorem is not true anymore, the whole finite element, finite element method is not uh, not um, correct anymore. So the, the error that you get will be not of order one. So this is not converging. So right. So so the, the algorithm doesn't converge. Doesn't work. Then you have to you have to change the algorithm into something smarter. So my point to you is that, okay, if you know the Luxman gram algorithm, you will see immediately into, into the equation that, okay, this finite element method is not working. Um, so, so, um, so basically uh, those, um, finite, um, so basically those uh, Luxman gram theorem has a, a very limited application. It has to, um, to be applied to um, bilinear functions that are co coercive. So if you have cases like this, in which the bilinear form is not coercive, Luxman gram theorem doesn't work, and then finite element method doesn't work. You have to, to have a, a, a clever way to, to go around it. Not this kind of rough finite element, finite element method algorithm. All right? So any questions? So if not, we're going to see each other again on Wednesday. Okay, so have a nice afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.